Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for coming to this session. Um, what I want to talk about is um, how do we use enterprise architectures to increase uh, enterprise retrieval. Uh, this work is based largely on the work of my PhD student, uh, Hassan, who is uh, my PhD student at Cairo University. I'm a professor of information systems there, and I'm currently visiting the uh, University of College of London Interaction Centre here at the University of London. Obviously, for for the institution in Cairo, I've been in the UK for a very long time. Um, I'd just like to um, tell you what we're uh, talking about. Um, uh, just some remarks to show some background for you, so they can. Uh, evaluate or understand where I'm coming from. Um, then something about the parallel of architecture. Uh, then has anybody in this room been to any of my presentations in the last two conferences? Uh, okay, uh, that will be that. Um, and then something about uh, resilience through architectural thinking and process. And then our future framework, which uh, uh, I don't claim to have been uh, rigorously tested yet. Obviously, the test uh, and test framework for resilience takes a long time and special circumstances. But at least you can uh, help me out here with some of your remarks and tools, uh, and I'm sure I can tra transfer them. Uh, Hassan was actually planning to be here as well, but I think he couldn't make it. So I'll see what we need and work and stuff like that. But well, this is just, this is just from my own background, and I've been to a personal journey that I'd like to share with you. Uh, my, my very first undergraduate degree was in management sciences with computing. So that's when I was first exposed to things like program design, modularity, and, and making your program uh, adaptable and flexible against change and stuff like that. Uh, then I came to the UK to do a master's in uh, system analysis and design, where I studied JAX, JSD, JAX system development. Anyone familiar with that? JSD? Fantastic, yeah. I think the ground was also, you were talking about it earlier, uh, was the ground in this presentation. Um, and then I went to Brunel University where I actually taught uh, software engineering and computer systems for a number of years and did my PhD there as well in systems engineering methodology. Now, something strange happened, right? Um, in the very last year where I was writing my PhD, I discovered I have such a big passion for architecture. I just loved what they did. I like what they do, um, diagrams and the proofs and stuff like that. So I decided to go and study architecture. So I actually did uh, two degrees in architecture. One uh, a bachelor's at Greenwich University and a master's at UCL because I went there as a senior research fellow. Now these these two uh, architecture degrees have influenced my thinking quite a bit about what does it mean to architect a system or software. Um, um, I've been lucky also to be exposed uh, to other things like innovation, uh, design thinking. So you, when you say EA in architecture, do you mean real architecture? Yes. Yeah, yes. Architecture. Yeah. Real art, real hard work. Yes, absolutely. My proper studio yes, and actually. Real art? How have you done all this? Um, it, it's about passion, really. I'm sure that, uh, I work all the time, but it just really, it really took my fancy. Uh, as I said earlier, when I was writing up my PGA, I thought that was really fun. I mean, and, and the way I justified it then to my department at Brunel is that I wanted to teach software engineering the way architects were taught how to design. Uh, and obviously, I was very lucky to have a very understanding head of the problem. And I said, yeah, go ahead and do it. I said, well, that means I just feel one day a week for, for I years. Said, that's fine. <laughs> I'll even pay you, pay you fees for the first year. So that's exactly what happened. Um, um, now, the other thing about me moving to uh, Beach in Cairo and, and, and uh, be a member of staff as well as a consultant is that actually industry that we trust academics and all that they do here. So I think in like three or four years, I did as many consultants as I've done you know, we're like 15 years in the UK, so that was very lucky. So innovation, UX, I did innovation, UX, I got trained and trained on design thinking, ideas, and stuff like that. And I'm very happy to see all these terms coming up in the presentations in this conference, yeah? Many people refer to design thinking, innovation, uh, and value of UX. Uh, only last semester I was teaching a course at the University of Westminster on digital innovation and disruption. So it's all sort of connecting up together, and Hassan came to me a few years ago wanting to do a PhD in the area of enterprise architecture. He's actually an enterprise architect. Uh, his job is a business architect, but he is TOGAF certified. So we've been sort of discussing a lot about that. Um, now let's, let's just look at, at some of the sort of most uh, um, famous uh, case studies. Uh, now do you want to be like Nokia and Blockbuster and Kodak, or do you want to be like Fuji, Go, IBM and Apple? That's really the stark choice here. I mean, with all the uh, disruptions and innovation that are going on, Many big and established companies have actually virtually been wiped out in a, in a matter of only a few years. Who would have thought that Nokia, that uh, I think about 10 years ago sold 
two thirds of all the mobile handsets in the world would just cease to exist until obviously the, the brand was uh, brought up again by Microsoft when they found out that, that, that Microsoft, uh, or, yeah, Microsoft uh, uh, phones, Windows phones, did not didn't really take off that all that much. But uh, in essence, they have been uh, grossly disrupted. And the question that we're thinking about really, oh, sorry, I think I pressed the wrong button there. Yeah. Uh, can architecture help companies not be disrupted in this way at all? Can, they, can architectures make them more resilient to change and be able to cope with that? Uh, I think the, sort of the easy answer for this, for me at least, is yes, but we'll see, we'll see in a minute uh, how and why. Um, um, I think for me, really, um, uh, one of the uh, questions that disturbed me when I first heard the term architecture being used in software and systems is that people all too often refer to what we used to refer to as structures many years ago when we designed programs and flow charts and uh, uh, plaza diagrams and stuff like that, and now calling them architectures. Uh, those of you who've been to the keynote speech uh, and saw the very complex art artifact uh, that uh, I think was, was Simon, I'm not very good with the name, uh, put up and saying, okay, uh, let your client or your business owners understand that. And the diagram that you put up, the artifact, uh, had lots of arrows and decision diamonds and boxes and stuff like that. Sort of stuff that we used to do when we designed programs in flow charts something like 40 years ago uh, or more. Uh, so the idea is um, uh, architecture should be at a higher uh, level, much higher level of granularity than what we used to call structure and very uh, uh, nitty gritty sort of detail and very intricate detail on how uh, uh, routines or modules would be called and, and decisions and, and flow control, uh, uh, yeah, control flow and things like that. So uh, for me architecture really is about uh, coming up with good architecture that has some immersion properties or qualities that would not exist in any single element by itself. This is really key. Architecture has immersion properties and qualities that result from you putting things together in a certain way. It's not just about an architecture that works or delivers the business function that you want, because many architectures would be computationally equivalent they would do the same thing. At the end of the day, computer program, cool, computer programs are Turing machines. They all do the same thing. It's just how they do it. Uh, so things like accommodating new requirements is essential, uh, helping transform the business model, support the business model transformation, rapid problems and issues, adaptation and adaptations and, and bug fixes and problem uh, 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 treatments or replication uh, problems, uh, easy, uh, easy to adapt to new environments, hardware, software, uh, infrastructure, business requirements, uh, human environment, customer tastes and trends maybe also. Uh, it's separate itself. So basically, it's about qualities, uh, and maybe also enabling uh, responsiveness to, to disruption. Now, um, uh, part of the argument that brought up here is from my study of, of Jackson system development. Now, the business model has something very uh, unusual in that uh, Jackson says, "Do not ask about what are the requirements up front for designing software. Ask what the system is about." So it's very different. Start there instead of saying, okay, what are the business uh, functions and services and what applications to support and then the infrastructure. So it's a very top down design in the very usual way. Now, with top down design, you gear your entire system architecture towards the requirements that are obvious and knowable then. Once the requirements change because there's a limited disruption, because you're threatened, because the customer uh, tastes have changed, because the environment has changed, you have to redo a lot of that, maybe not all of it, but you have to redo a lot of that at a very high cost of trying to respond to disruptions. Now, the interesting thing about JSD is that if you start with this kind of layer, which are the base objects, if you like, or the base entities, the, uh, the models of the essential subject matter of the system, you can implicitly, you have already implicitly defined a number of functions operating with that basic or core model. So you don't have to know all the requirements in advance, you just have to get the basic fabric of the system model properly. And then you can more easily plug in things like functions later on. So essentially, you at least preserve some part of the architecture for later use when uh, you need to respond to disruptions. You want to make a challenge make any time, by the way. Uh, I think that we have uh, less slides than I have for all this, this plot. Uh, so, okay, so let's go now to uh, architecture. <coughs> now, when I went to um, UCL to study spatial, spatial design as master's course on, on a fast identical studies, which they have renamed spatial design, 
I came across space syntax, which is a method for analyzing urban and soft and, and building configurations. And the, the discovery there is that by virtue of how the spatial grid is configured, this is like a, 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 a open grid, it's actually a museum, it's, it's the Day Britain Museum. Uh, by modeling the space in a certain way, you can actually predict people's movements according to how red the areas are. The redness is something about integration and connectedness of this particular part of the space. So the more red it is, the, the more people that you walk through it, and that's purely theoretical before they even watched anything. Obviously, use the observation to verify that this is the case. Same thing here well, with an urban grid. Uh, the way the urban grid is connected, the configurational nature of the urban grid predicted people's movement as well as actually things like the social behavior and crime rates. Now what this tells me is that the architecture has again brought up some emergent properties of behaviors. Because if configured things in a certain way, you could tell how this architecture could be used. What uses are permissible or allowable, what was possible. So the space defined what could happen later, even though the designer at the beginning did not predict all these uses. That's like structure is strategy there, isn't it? Pardon me? The structure determines the strategy of use. Exactly. Uh, well, yeah, the structure of, say, uh, just a higher level is the architecture, because the structure would be like individual streets and stuff like that. This is a higher level view. So by looking at how things are connected up together, the word configuration is really very important. It will give rise to behaviors that are not normal in advance. And I think I want to think about the structure and, and resilience in these terms. What sort of configuration of architecture could give rise to resilient behavior? Right? So this would be the question. Uh, so there are many, many parallels even in, 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 that, in the natural world and ecology and stuff like that. If you want to read more about this, I think this book was really quite key in, in getting you to understand even the, the term architecture at a much deeper level than what most people do. And then philosophy of architecture, what is it? It's an activity, it's a product, etc. etc. The book is space of the machine by Bill Hillier, who basically invented the space syntax technique for analyzing carbon I'm very sorry to see that, to that uh, image. That space is the machine. That's the book. Space is the machine by Bill Hillier. Right, okay. So so talk about this level and not about this level. Uh, when someone said I cannot show class diagrams for my client because it's for architecture, well in architecture we don't show the client the structure of a wall or a window and ask them to judge it because this is much lower level of detail. This is really structural. And we would study things like that in construction courses in structure and construction class. Like we really need to really how to put two like uh, bricks together and stuff like that. How would you move, move wall? That sort of stuff. Right, okay, so so that was just uh, sharing uh, some of my background and motivation for looking at all this and trying to connect the two uh, fields of architecture and software and systems. Now let's look at resilience. Here's the definition. It, it's uh, uh, the has roots in the, uh, in the Latin uh, language. Uh, resilience means to adapt and bounce back from disruptive events. Yeah? So we can say that, okay, if the capacity of the system to absorb the disturbance undergo a change and retain the same essential functions, structural identity and feedbacks. Now if you read more in this area, you see some differences between resilient and resistant. Resistant is trying to keep its status quo no matter what. Um, and this is actually what we call engineering resilience. So it's about optimization and keeping exactly the same function for as long as possible. But ecological resilience implies that you can actually do more, more stuff to cook, you can actually adapt and transform, as you can see, for example, in natural evolution, things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, th this is about, the, uh, yeah, I think this, this is hard to explain in a very short time, but essentially, like all systems, natural or otherwise, are operating in what we call, what we call a basin of attraction. This is like the normal orbit, this is how we normally function. Yeah, there are changes in there, but within an overall envelope of potential according to how they are structured and how they are organized. Yeah, so for example, if you're in a company, you can, you can change the product, you can increase the uh, marketing, change the marketing, the packaging, the ingredients, the, there's a whole space of potential that you can develop within your, your, your sort of playground here on the left, until something really structured happens. Yeah, something really key, a key change in the environment, or someone else can be even internally, that kicks you out of this basin of attraction, the normal sphere of things, your normal orbit into a different orbit, if you like, so you flip into a different basin of attraction that you may be not uh, very, very um, sort of accustomed to. 
Now, and this, this also uh, is very interesting. Uh, is it really that complex in the sense that anything can change, uh, sort of the chaos theory and the butterfly effect? Uh, uh, anything can pull you out uh, or push you out of your normal goal and send you somewhere else? No, not anything. Because there are a smaller set of critical variables that can actually do that. So not all factors are equally influential. That's the important point. Uh, so, um, Walker and Mayer say that complex and complex adaptive system like businesses. Uh, uh, they are affected by many variables, although they are affected by many variables, they are usually driven by only a handful of key controlling variables, and these are really what we're looking for. So can we determine what are the key controlling variables that we can get ready for, and therefore control, or at least predict this jump, and be able to deal with it when it comes, although we can never really fully reliably predict them. So that's the essential thing about the structure, we can not fully predict them, but can maybe sense when the structure is coming. So this is key. Only a handful of key controlling variables, but not all controlling variables uh, are equally important. Now, this is about just the, uh, the different ecological and engineering resilience. Now, in engineering resilience, we're trying to maintain efficiency of operations, constantly in the system, in the predictable world. Yeah, so it's sort of more, more, uh, you get, have more visibility, you have uh, a very clear objective function, if you like. Um, so we, engineering resilience is about resisting disturbance and uh, preserving the uh, status quo. Uh, ecological resilience, you have much more wider envelope for operating. You can actually do things like uh, adapting, can do things like uh, transformation. But obviously, the, the time scale might be uh, much longer. You need to be aware of many uh, different uh, or unpredictable factors that can actually cause you to, to carry out that job. Anyway, so we try to um, look at uh, what makes certain, uh, uh, what uh, led to the success of certain enterprises, for example, the Woody film, why were they much more successful than Kodak, even though they worked in the same domain. And when I was doing film a few many years ago, I mean, everything was Kodak. You get Kodak paper, you get Kodak uh, chemicals, you get uh, Kodak films, regardless of what, but, you know, they, they can shift it out. So through uh, the lots of the literature and various case studies like IBM, like Apple, like uh, Blockbuster, like uh, uh, Fujifilm and Kodak, uh, we've come up with this set of what we call resilience design principles. I'm not going to leave all of this, we can uh, get, get into slides later, but essentially is to say if you want to design a resilient system, you need to take care of these things. For example, connectivity. Yeah? Uh, have you heard about Marks and Spencer's having really problems and having to close many, many branches and stuff like that. I mean, it's really, it's really amazing. It's, it's, this company has been very successful for many, many years. How come they've, they've come to this kind of, uh, kind of idea? Uh, same thing with John Lewis. The very sort of high street, very established retailers. Let's take just uh, one kind of example. Uh, they're, not really, they're not really winning these days. I think one of the problems is that they're not connected with, uh, with their customers. I personally feel that because I shop there a lot. They don't know what customers want. They have, have weak information flow from the shop floor to the decision makers or the buyers or the designers of the various, various various parts. For example, so if you want to be resilient against changes, for example, in customer tastes and trends, you need to get, keep very good, uh, very high information, you know, information highway between you and the target customers. For example, you need to monitor trends. Yeah? For example, people are now converting to uh, more ecological uh, merchandise, things that are biodegradable, etc., etc., carbon, uh, carbon uh, uh, footprint and stuff like that. You need to be aware of that. Uh, also, you need to focus on your core capabilities. And this is something I've, I've, I've lectured a lot on, on in innovation. In innovation, if you want to innovate and move from one uh, 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 like state of play to another that's more profitable, you need to know where your strengths are. Yeah? So, for example, if you're in food manufacturing, uh, and you're producing um, uh, artists is that way around, you improve that way around. If you're doing things like oils and, and various uh, ingredients for machine operations, then you can move to uh, feeding animals on the basis of the result of what you've been doing for machines. So in both cases, it seems very different, but it's the same set of core skills. You can deal with fluids, you can uh, dry them up, you can extract certain nutrients from them or certain chemicals from them and so on. So moving from one uh, stage to another, based on what things you can do best is really very key, which means you need to be aware of, of your, your core capabilities. And so on, so forth. Learning is very important. That scenario planning, I'll mention that later on when I come to another analogy of architecture. So, 
these are things you need to try and do if you if you want to make um, uh, your company more resilient, or if you want to design architecture with high resilience content. Now again, uh, from architecture, uh, uh, these, these two books again have been very influential. One, one is by Stuart Grant, he's a, an architectural uh, writer, uh, writer of architecture. Uh, the book, How Buildings Learn, What Happens After They Build, gives you a lot of insight on actually how to make a, an artifact of some sort much more flexible against change. And uh, uh, let me just skip this slide a little bit, come back to it in a minute. Um, he has this, uh, this diagram, which actually I saw later in the book by Zansky and Woods on, on, on software architecture. Uh, this is about uh, the particular uh, constructional view of buildings that says, well, you have the most uh, stable layer at the bottom, which is the site doesn't, doesn't change as long as you have this particular building. Um, uh, by way of sort of uh, slightly less changeable uh, layer, you have the structure. And further on, you have the uh, 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 sorry, the uh, the uh, uh, go there. The skin, the skin layer is just the outside, but it's just thin, a little thinner uh, line than the one before it. And then the surfaces, and then the space plan, and then the stuff. All of these change at different rates, at different speeds, because people tend to want changes in these layers of, of construction at different rates. Um, and what Steve Brand says here that buildings that are adaptable and easily reconfigurable according to the needs of the users have these layers loosely coupled from each other. I'm not talking about individual components here. It's not like in, in, in software engineering where you have modules that are loosely coupled and, and highly cohesive, but we have whole layers of similar components that change at similar rates of change. Yeah, so if they, these are separated, uh, you will have an easier time, for example, changing your services layer by adding maybe a new bathroom or uh, a new uh, ventilation plant without having to rebuild the whole thing, without having to mess with the uh, structural layer, for example. So, uh, so architecture that adapt have this particular view. Uh, you can say that this is one part of resilience, but it's not the whole story. If you are going to deal with resilience via um, uh, an adaptation strategy, so this is one of the things you can do, tease out layers, or separate them, so that they don't affect each other unnecessarily. So fundamentally, you need to develop a number of capabilities here in the business that can actually come up with a design like this, with an operational life, uh, structure like this, if this is your chosen strategy. So essentially, we're trying to establish what are the core capabilities based on the design principles I introduced uh, earlier, so that you can actually uh, design, design a more resilient uh, architecture. Um, so, this is how we, we normally go. Uh, if you look at from uh, the starting point of business transformations and what strategic disruptions you can actually uh, uh, sort of predict or imagine can happen to you, uh, as well as transformation vision, you uh, uh, articulate this via a resilience uh, based framework, which helps you to provide actually uh, actionable plans that you can actually uh, use to reconfigure or design your architecture so that you can actually have these uh, major properties that I mentioned earlier on. Sorry to interrupt, if we go off that slide, how much of that is related to the shell, the work that Shell did on their plausible futures? Because it looks very similar. So who's working on Shell in the 80s and oh, 90s did okay. plausible futures. Yeah. Okay. Which is basically a strategic scenario tested against plausible futures. You then metricate in a resilient based framework to see how well things perform. And then you try and identify yeah. trigger points for when my current strategy will fail in two years. Or if I can identify this, I can come up with an actionable plan that will work in yeah. the two years that I've got that. Yeah, it, it, it's very close as well as that of the work on, on scenario planning as well, because in scenario planning, we try to do the same. And the uh, same thing has been mentioned in Stuart Brown's book where he gets uh, like four different types of buildings for the same company, depending on what future they see for themselves. But I have slight problem with that actually in that uh, I don't want to emphasize the prediction as an advantage. Okay. Yeah? Because again, as, as Jürgen says, all predictions eventually fail. So I don't want to gear prediction too much into this, but if you have developed the capabilities that I mentioned It's earlier. not so much prediction, it's the plausible future. It doesn't yeah. have a prediction, it just tries to identify when you've got a trigger point. Yeah. Very, uh, in the Nokia case, if they'd had a plausible phone, when does a major player like Apple come in and introduce a new phone? 
do we need, if, uh, if that happens, we need that's a reassess point. So you're trying to flag up those points that aren't going to be where you are predicting change. You're predicting an indicator that change is liable to happen. Yeah. So it's a reassess point. Why is this the same thing, isn't it? Because if you can't understand what are these trigger points, it's like prediction by a different type, it's not detail. Like for example, it's more open, but yes. 20 years ago, who would have thought that Apple would want to develop a telephone? It, it would have been hard, wouldn't it? Yeah, but that's part of it. I mean, it's, carry on. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, it's whether you want to do a detailed prediction of exactly what might happen, or you want to predict or single out a, a factor that could lead to uh, an uncertain future, as you say. Yeah, look, for me, architectures are all about doing future prediction because yeah. you create the 2D architecture, which is a future prediction of where you want to be. Yes, but so we're that... predicting what the future will look like. And you know, one thing you can guarantee, your 2D architecture will not be what is actually delivered. Yes. <laughs> because the world will change. Yeah. I'm just worried about the starting point, to be honest, because you start, you start from this strategy uh, statement, yeah. and the strategy has a vision that is predicated on certain scenarios and certain futures, even if subconsciously or not exactly. Yeah, no, but that's the point of why you get other people to develop this. The technique is to get other people to come up with plausible futures. Yeah. Um, which are not designed by the scenario people, they're designed by people that are potential futures that can come forwards. Yeah. And then you then test to see how that scenario works in those plausible futures and you try and identify what a precursor is to a failure. That can work, but for the structure sometimes you, can, you could not have predicted a particular... Oh yeah, if someone doesn't come up yeah. with a plausible future, it's exactly. actually the actual future you're stuck. Exactly, right? so what if you, if you are faced with a plausible future or future that you have not thought of before, you could not have expected? And this is really where this comes in. We want we want the system that's for like pressure to have like its DNA can enable it to cope with the un unforeseen future. How you need the muscles to be able to lift something that you would not have predicted what exactly it would need to lift. So hence hence the, the orientation that we're defending, which is capability here. So instead of uh, targeting specific vision, specific state that may or may not work, yeah. you want but you you both use it. I see very little difference to what you're putting forward in that technique. Well, as I said, this, 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 particular, this particular slide is based on, on you know, uh, identified strategic disruptions, but uh, if taking that one, one step back and not actually trying to identify uh, future disruptions or specific scenarios, uh, we could say, like, you know, you need to engage in an adaptive cycle early on, whereby you build up, you build up the muscle, you build up the, the Abilities to be able to exploit your your uh, core capabilities and then use them, yeah, when time for a patient transformation comes. Um, so it's like you know you have you have two loops here. Yeah, the front loop is about uh, enabling you to address potential sleeping disruptions without actually being able to know exactly what they are or what 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 alternatives they might be. So it's this thing about how if I miss one important scenario or one important cause of And that will work until your muscles snap because they're not strong enough. So well, again, that will have its point where it fails. Uh, potentially, but uh, you know... Um, um, you have a degree. Whatever mechanism you put in to cope with the future, yeah. it will always have a potential stress point where Absolutely. it fails. Absolutely. Absolutely. You cannot, you cannot uh, sort of be ready for every possible eventuality. It's like the adage of, you know, you cannot predict the future, but you can... Even if you could do it. Sorry? But even if you could do it, Mentally viable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you really you you are ready for a range of uh, possible adaptations or a range of possible uh, scenarios, not, not all of them. But it's just the wide the wider scale that if you have been too closely focused on functions and the strategy and the business services that you can now see. So it's really the point. I mean, we've got ten minutes just to um, keep on track. Okay, it's just like like having uh, complete flexibility is completely uh, uh, unfeasible. Yeah, but you have to put your flexibilities where they matter most. And this, this one, this we really find to say implicitly as a result of your question, not not for all future, but a wide range of them. Uh, so this is like the, the framework that comes together. Really, and obviously, this is too much to uh, to uh, explain in detail. But at, at the bottom here, we have uh, this commitment to an ecological resilience paradigm rather than engineering resilience paradigm, and then you uh, apply your various uh, resilient design principle. Uh, by the way, we're not saying that this set of design principles that we have is finite, you can always come up with new uh, 
within the design principles on which radius you develop, decide which capabilities you need. But we must stress that the capabilities or business capabilities are not about fulfilling function that you can see now, it's about uh, developing capabilities that help you later on. The more you know, uh, as in the sort of uh, wheel I showed earlier, things like communication, things like uh, uh, monitoring, things like uh, core capabilities, things like information flow and stuff like that. So this is like sort of at the high level. I think if Mark Spencer had a much better information flow, you would not be in the situation we're in now. It's the DNA, please. Just sort of rolling here, or maybe you can the concept of negative feedback loops. Yes, yes. Uh, and how does that fit into this model? Well, it would be it would be one of the uh, the capabilities here, like monitoring uh, and learning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you have have okay. capacities for learning and monitoring and scanning the environment, you would be in a position to get these uh, negative signals earlier on, and you can adjust before before things go uh, belly up. So start, start sort of stuff. So really this again, this is like the muscles level, it's DNA level, the core yeah. capabilities that help you make use of negative feedback when you do it right. Otherwise if you don't have the models, you don't see them. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I was thinking about the this is a Gaia type resilience. Okay. Which um, we don't have much of that because it's not purposeful. You do have resilience. Yeah, it is ecological. It's ecological. Yeah, exactly. It's ecological resilience, exactly. Yeah, so we so you have a different approach which would be like balancing the abilities with negative feedback between them. But I think you're talking about different levels. Uh, the capability is, is the high level of being able to learn and, and to monitor, for example. Yeah? But the sort of substantive, the, the actual concrete uh, uh, feedback is what feeds into this one of these capabilities for you to use them. So it's the skill of making sense of negative feedback or, or information that sort of pushes you in the direction of adjusting your parameters. Okay. Yeah. Most of we are checking the afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I said it just. Uh, yeah. So I mean, this is this is the whole thing. So we go we go bottom up as well as top down at the same time. Uh, top down, we use things like sensors and uh, look at measures of performance. Maybe things like UX, uh, which has been referred to several uh, uh, locations uh, uh, here in the conference. Uh, UX, user experience, uh, innovation, stuff like that, design thinking. Are we actually going uh, in, the right, in the right or wrong direction? What are the drivers? Maybe customer feedback, maybe UX is as one of the important uh, transformation drivers. Uh, events, assessments, and scenarios. Uh, so that's top, going top down from the environment. Bottom up, we look at, uh, as I said, design principles and then capabilities, and we choose, then we have to instantiate various things here, like the architectural vision, the enterprise architecture development process, the roadmap and the fill in or populate the repository that we have. Let me just show you one, one, one two more uh, diagrams. Um, now, if we're talking resilience, we have identified again three generic strategies for dealing with disruptions. One is the mitigation, just little bits of adjust, adjustments within your same basin of attra attraction, uh, the same orbit if you like, and just making adjustments to the code. This is temporary, like if there's a new competitor, for example, a new trend that you need to deal with. Uh, versus an adaptation strategy where you move to a temporary place to cope with the, with the change and then, and then come back later. Maybe like things like Uber and the effect of Uber on, on taxis and stuff like that. They, do, they will not change to Uber as the conventional taxi, but maybe they will do something else that attracts some of the customers back to them. But in the long term, we know that this, this is not going to work if, if Uber trend continues on the pace. Um, as opposed to this is sort of like the most radical one, which is really transformability, transferring to a different envelope works again, being able to jump into a different orbit and a different uh, basin of attraction. So again, the capabilities or the capacities to cross the threshold into a different development trajectory. Does the architecture help you with that? Now I've come across this, this sort of uh, model by Linz, Linz and other people in the book uh, 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 in the book on, on transformation, uh, business model transformation. Obviously, again, I can talk through all, the, all of these, but they talk about um, the business models being uh, shifting from one quarter to another, whether it's a business uh, platform model, or is it a product model, or the product business model, or is it a solution business model. And they say, well, in, in transforming businesses, you can actually take a number of trajectories, a number of paths 
clearly is. So whether you want to go from the product business model to a platform going to solution, or in the other direction, or even just diagonally uh, straight up. I think something like uh, perhaps if I take uh, IBM, IBM was a product based business model, they sold products, yeah, but when they had the threat in the 80s and all the uh, PC manufacturers, a few PC manufacturers have cut into the, the sales quite dramatically, they've moved across to a solution provider. So this is one, one business model transformation. Now one of the questions is, did their architecture support them? To what extent that was costly in terms of readjusting the various architecture elements moving in that direction? There are many other sort of examples of, uh, uh, like at Kodak, have moved to become uh, providers of chemicals, essentially, and, and, and hardware. They have just left the traditional uh, playing, uh, playground of films and, 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 and photographic paper. Yeah, it's that, it's that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, Ray-Ban uh, have moved from being uh, eyewear, an eyewear company to an eye care company. They started to be used uh, uh, equipment for laser surgeries, for of that, you know, eye, eye surgery and stuff like that. It's all these transformations and COVID. Rolls Royce did the same. Rolls Royce started to provide power by the hour. Yeah, they don't sell you an engine anymore. They sell you power depending on how many hours of flight you've done. If you're sort of renting one of their uh, uh, jet, jet, jet engines for the aircraft, that's that sort of stuff. So, uh, so I think enterprise architecture needs to be carried out with view to the potential transformation of, of this type. So again, it's about building the DNA, building the muscle to be able to cope with a number of these uh, transformations via looking at uh, capabilities based on uh, design principles that we have advocated or whether you find more suitable for your business and environment. Okay, so one of the take home messages, architecture is more about emergent distinct properties rather than just functionalities. It's not just about getting performing or getting the job done. It's about having properties in the future that enable you to cope with various main qualities. Uh, architecture is a higher level than structure. So this is, I'm oh, sorry to have to repeat this, but this is really very important. A class like that was not the class of architecture, it's structure. So we need to think at a higher level of that. So Jackson would have put uh, all types of objects into a core layer called the model processes because they are about the core subject matter of the system. So that's the bottom, of, that's the category of, of um, objects or class types. It's not an individual class or an individual object. Uh, architecture we can have a to resilience of potential scenarios. Uh, so we can use potential futures, but don't control it reliably too much. Uh, enterprise architecture contain elements for monitoring the environment and for critical drivers. We said earlier that there's only a handful of critical drivers that can cause this shift uh, and kick the business out of their normal trajectory or orbit into a different one we call the of action. Uh, finally, the study should or may contain elements of business uh, model transformation projection as well. Uh, to just remind you, this this type of uh, diagram of business model transformation. Because we all have to transform at some point. So transformation is key. Whether that's sort of radical or gradual, it depends on what kind of environment you are.